Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, you made it through another year. One nice thing about being a Christian in a liturgical church, we get to hit the end of the year well before the rest of the world and some years you're really glad to see in your rearview mirror, I imagine. Maybe not quite like it was back in 2020 when you're really glad to see some of those things disappear, but still, a lot has happened that hurt, a lot has happened that we wish hadn't, that we wish we could undo, a lot has happened to us, and a lot has been done by us. But as we look back, just as we do in the earthly change of the year or so, also we look forward. We look back, though, as Christians, not in regret because we know all of our sins are forgiven. We look back not to count up what people have done to us, but rather what God has done for us. We don't even blame ourselves now because we know that God has forgiven all our sins. If we look back, we do so to take example, but also to take heart, to know that the Lord has shepherded us every step of the way, just as he promises here in Ezekiel. I, I myself, will search for my sheep. The Lord criticizes those in Israel, the priests and the rulers who were misleading his people, who were guiding them into false worship or who were not leading them into true worship. Those who either actively sinned against him by inviting false gods into the lives of the people or those who were doing so passively just by not really caring or doing anything about it. And also then the sheep who followed them. Because even if you have somebody who misleads you, every one of God's children should also be able to examine God's word and say, hey, that's wrong. And it's still your task today. To hear your pastor and say, hey, that's right or hey, that's wrong. He's either speaking God's word or he's not. He's either speaking the truth or he's speaking lies. Those are the polar opposites right there in, in our scriptures today and in life in general, throughout the Bible and throughout everyday life. There's really not any shade of meaning. It's either right or wrong, good or bad, beautiful or hideous. And the Lord sees such a mess that he says, I'm going to have to go down there and fix it myself. Of course, that's not a new idea with God, is it? He went down when Adam and Eve sinned against him, calling Adam and giving him and Eve a chance to repent, to confess. But instead they hid, and it was only grudgingly that they finally admitted that anything they had done was wrong, and even as they admitted it, each pointed the finger of blame at somebody else. Adam at Eve, and sort of at the God who had given him Eve, and Eve, of course, at the serpent, and at that pretty fruit that God had planted in the middle of the garden. But it was their fault. The serpent should have been able to tell them lies all the live long day, forever and ever, and they should have just ignored him. But because of that, they were held responsible, and because they fell into sin, they corrupted and crippled the entire human race from there on out. And sin has only grown since then. So the Lord corrected them then. The Lord comes down more actively at some times than others. We see it when he visits Abraham. When he visits wrath then upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see it at other times when one of the prophets has a specially intense vision, either the Lord speaking directly to him as Moses or Elijah on the mountaintop. Or in other situations and circumstances where they're actually caught up as Ezekiel was during some of his vision. Where he sees a vision of what it's like to be around the throne of God. God does actively involve himself. And no more so than in what he's promising right here. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. That's good, isn't it? Because we can certainly get ourselves lost in sin and doubt, and despair and sorrow, whatever. Even if it's not that we are lost in our own sinfulness, the hurts and the pains and the worries of this world can mislead us. 
cause us to take our eyes off of our shepherd, to stop listening to our shepherd. And that's never a good thing. I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. He's talking specifically, first of all here, to Judah. The only bit that's left of the nation of Israel, along with some of the Levites who are still mixed in there. Some of Benjamin, a few of Simeon, and then some of the other tribes that had intermarried and were in the area of Judah. But the other parts of the kingdom had already disappeared. The Assyrians took care of them, and Babylon was taking care of the rest. And he's talking to a people who will endure now captivity for 70 years and who have even more chance to despair, to doubt, to worry that God cares for them. They will be scattered among the nations. As often happened back in those days, if they didn't completely destroy a people, sometimes they would root up large parts of it and scatter it throughout their empire so that, sort of like at Babel, they couldn't get a good revolution going because they didn't have much in common except for the people who were ruling them. They were crippled by not being able to use their own language. They were hindered by not being able to work with the things that were familiar to them. And so, in the right time, the Lord would reach out into the nations, most specifically into Babylon, which then became the Persian Empire, and pull them back. But, he's not only talking about bringing them out, he's talking about bringing all of us out. All of his people who believe in him. Not just Judah, not just the people of David, not just those who lived in the vicinity of Jerusalem, who lived on Mount Zion, but his people who by faith would come to know him throughout all the centuries following. The Gentiles, you and me and others. And he's going to do these things, using the image of shepherd and sheep, like he promises through David in the 23rd Psalm and elsewhere. And then he also promises judgment, doesn't he? If they don't believe me, if they don't follow me, then finally I will cast them out. I will not know them. They will be lost to themselves, to one another, to me forever. And he has specifics. And again, you, you see the image of the animals here, don't you? The sheep. You push with side and shoulder. Fat hogs shove away skinny hogs. Fat cattle can push away skinny cattle. And fat sheep We'll do the same to skinny. Those who eat the best tend to keep eating and keep the others from having their fair share. And you thrust at all the weak with your horns. They're actively involved, not only in hoarding things for themselves, the food, the money, the power, whatever it was that they had, but then they actively injure others around them. And that's what our sin does. Not only is it us grabbing for ourselves, but in one way or another, it's also us putting the hurt on other people. Not loving them with our whole heart. Being short-tempered, ill-spoken. Not taking the time for somebody who really has a need. Not supporting those who are in dire straits, whether it's through food offerings like we collect around this time of year, cash donations to one thing or another, making special attempts to help those who are poor shop so that their families can have a Merry Christmas, whatever that is. We fall flat all too often. And so he talks about rescuing them, which means he's talking about rescuing you. When you stray, when you step out of the paths that he has set for you, he doesn't, first of all, smite you dead and cast you away. He works with all of his might to draw you back to him to hold on to you, to keep calling you through the word, feeding you through the supper so that you will stay with him and rejoice in that presence. I will judge between sheep and sheep. Jesus has that picture then in Matthew 25 of the sheep and the goats. Same sort of thing, though. 
you get over here and you go over there. Those on my right hand, everlasting life. Those on my left, so long, farewell, I never knew you. And then I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And that can be a head scratcher, right? David's already been dead for quite some time by the time the Lord speaks through the prophet here. And by the time all of this is fulfilled, he'll have been dead even longer. Plus, God just said, I, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out. I will seek out my sheep. I will feed them. I will be the shepherd. And then just a few breaths later, he says, they will have one shepherd, my servant, David. Well, who's it going to be? Is it the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who called Abraham out of the sinful past, the idol-worshiping filled past that he had, and made promises to him that he continued through Isaac and Jacob, that he kept them then all through the time in Egypt, and began answering them in the Exodus? How can he be the shepherd over all and then David, a mortal king, a good king, a king who God praises, but yet also a man who sinned, a man who violated God's word in several different instances. The ones we remember the most probably are those involving his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, but there were times before and after that also when he did things that displeased God and either he or his people suffered for them. But this is an image not of the David of old, but of David made right. Just as in Adam all sinned, Jesus, the new Adam, takes away the sin. And as under David, the people were ruled wisely and well, but not completely well and not completely wisely because David was a sinner, so also in Christ we have a new David, a new king who's been king all along. Not only the king of the Jews, not only the king of Israel, but the king of all. The Lord of all creation. We shouldn't be surprised when finally in the New Testament, we realize that God has taken on human flesh. Emmanuel is tucked away in the pages already of the prophets. And how people could skip over this and at the time of Jesus wonder how this guy from Bethlehem, from Nazareth, this nondescript fellow, but of the house and the lineage of David, as Luke is careful to point out, how this guy can be God. But somebody's got to have this job of being the king, of being the shepherd. Somebody, some human being, will rule over God's people. We'll be their shepherd. We'll go out to find the lost sheep, to bind up their wounds, to bring them back home. He will do all of these things at the right time, under the right circumstances. And we even get a foretaste of that when he's talking about being their shepherd in terms of being God. I'll bring them out. And they will come out when? When they have clouds and thick darkness. They have gloom and doom. Which is exactly when the new David did that, wasn't it? Shrouded in the darkness of Golgotha, hanging there on the cross, the king stretches out his arms and glorifies his father as he dies. And the Father glorifies him by raising him from the dead and setting him up over all who believe in him. Setting him up as the king of all creation, the Lord of the universe. Making sure that the scepter does not depart from Judah. That the son of David continues to rule God's people forever and ever. On that dark and gloomy day, the Lord undid Adam's fall. He undid 
all the sins of all the world. He undid your sins and mine. And he continues now to be your shepherd. The God who came down is also the man who was born in Bethlehem. The God who came down is the guy who grew up in obscurity in Nazareth. The God who came down, an heir of David, is the one who preached, who taught, who worked the miracles, who predicted, who prophesied, and who finally died. And the God who came down is also then the God who lives forever and ever, the one who was raised on the third day and now has all things under his control. And that's a good thing. God took on human flesh and he knows every one of your aches and pains and sorrows and hurts. And because he's God, he could do something. He could do everything about it. He brings the healing. He brings the restoration. He brings the life that was thrown away in Eden. He brings us to this place now to hear these words of joy and celebration again. Jesus came, suffered, and died for us. Emmanuel, God with us, is God who was and is one of us. And he is the God who will return on the last day. And we need not fear any judgment or any separation because as we believe in Christ now, so we know that on the last day, he will say, welcome. Come, all of you. And when all the works are lined up, we say, well, when did we do this? We are so busy living lives of Christian love that we don't even realize that we were taking care of Jesus' needs as well. Because the God who came down, the shepherd his people, came down a helpless infant. He came down needing to be nursed and have his diapers changed. He came down needing to learn to walk and to talk. He came down needing food and shelter and sleep. He came down with all of our needs. And he felt those needs for you and me. He knows your hurts and pains and sorrows and sufferings because he had his hurts and pains and sorrows and sufferings not deserved but take it on so that you won't endure them forever and ever. David is your shepherd. The new David, the son of David, the king of the Jews, the king of all creation, the Lord of life, Jesus Christ. As you think of the God who loves you, think of the son who came down to rescue you and give thanks to the spirit who created and sustains faith in you that you will hear the voice of your shepherd and follow where he leads. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.